of time. I'm Fred Hargadon, uh, Dean of Admissions, and what I'm going to do is give you an overview of uh, admissions as best I can in uh, I confess that I'm surprised that anybody uh, showed up, given everybody I meet is an expert in admissions already, uh, wherever I go. But I'll try and enlighten uh, some of you. Consider this, um, you might consider this admissions 101, uh, the first class for which I will tell you the assigned reading the four books that probably, uh, you'll have to let me know if you can't see that, are the ones I always recommend to new staff admissions officers and, uh, and certainly that I really read once in a while that come in handy. Probably the handiest book over the uh, length of time I've done admissions is The Phantom Tollbooth uh, by Norton Jester. Uh, uh, just about every chapter in that book has something to say about how we do admissions. Um, at any rate, and uh, since a lot of what we do in admissions involves writing, I always recommend to the staff uh, William Zinser's On Writing Well, a book which I've recommended for years and didn't know until I got to Princeton that he's actually a Princeton graduate. Um, and was happy to see that I recommend his book. Donald Hall's book is one I've only really read the last couple of years, a poet, partly because uh, he writes so much about the life of work and the ethic of work. And if you don't have the ethic of work, you don't make it an admissions. And the other book is uh, John Gardner's book on excellence, which I think is probably the one book everybody ought to read, whatever your job, whatever your task. Um, the size of the admission staff is about 30. We have 15 uh, admissions officers or professional staff, and we have 15 support staff. The question is, uh, how do we recruit these people? Uh, what motivates the way we hire people is an ad from the London Times in 1909 when they were advertising for people to go on an expedition. Uh, to the South Pole, it pretty much describes uh, how we uh, invite people to be admissions officers. It is a hazardous journey, the wages are small, and the likelihood of getting out safely is doubtful. Um, what do we do during the year? We, uh, the round of the year, as I call it, looks like something like the following. We um, actually get inquiries that we log into the computer and send something, some sort of publication to. About 160,000 people write or call in a year. These can be uh, sophomores or juniors or seniors. If they're seniors, they get the application and the admissions information booklet. If they're juniors or sophomores, they get smaller introductory pamphlets, a letter telling them that we'll keep them on the list until they become seniors. But just think of logging in 160,000 names, addresses, high schools, and so forth, then sending them information. Uh, the students who come by our office beginning in May 1st, we've already seen students now who are going to apply for the class of 2000. Between May 1st and the end of uh, December, we'll see around 3,200 students who actually make appointments to come in to our small group sessions in the office. In addition, we always run noontime sessions during May to December, uh, which are biggest in the summer and in the fall when uh, people without appointments, parents, families uh, come and we usually hold it in a room like this. We hold 195 of those during the year for uh, from mid-September, mid to late September to the middle of December, the staff travels. We visit a um, uh, around 1,100 high schools around the country and, and in some foreign countries individually. Wherever we travel, we send postcards to all of those people that are on our computer that are going to be seniors telling them we're in the area. Uh, and if we're not hitting their school, usually we're holding an evening program in addition and they're invited to the evening program. And we hold about 145 of those evening programs during the year. 
daily incoming phone calls to our office run about 250 to 300. It's just amazing how many people call in. Um, we have alumni schools committees that we service. There are 200 plus committees with about 4,000 members. So we do periodic mailings to them. We do weekly mailings to the committees once the applicants have applied, letting them know which applicants have had interviews so far, which have, have not. Um, and then we end up reading uh, and evaluating applications this year, 14,311. Our applicants this year came from around 5,100 different high schools in 115 countries. Uh, remember the number 5,100 because uh, we offer admission to around 2,000 students for a class of 1,130. Uh, if we limited ourselves to admitting only one student at any high school, there would still be 3,000 some high schools who had applicants that had nobody admitted. That's um, one of the long range, ongoing um, PR problems for any admissions office. And that's the round of the year. In terms of reading applications, um, oh, paperwork. Um, there's a lot of paperwork involved in admissions. Uh, this year, number of applications, 14,311. The average number of documents for an application is 15. They don't all come from the same place. So the candidate sends his or her part in, the school sends the counselor's report in, the transcript in, two different teachers send their recommendations in. Uh, we get test scores from the testing agency two or three times a year for the same candidate. On and on, all of those documents. Uh, the number that have to be dated on receipt, we date everything and then file all of these documents in the right files is almost 215,000 documents. This all being done by that same 15 support staff and 15 admission officers. The total number of documents we log under the computer is around 143,000. We don't log every extra letter in, but we do log in the part one, the essay, part, uh, that's part two, the two teacher recommendations, the school report, the transcript. We log all of those in when we get them so that when it comes around to February, we want to know who is missing what in their folder. We can do a computer printout. We then, um, as you'll see down the, the list, we send missing items letters to candidates in February saying, um, we've only received one teacher recommendation. We, the computer will tell them the name of the teacher we did receive the recommendation from. That's put on the computer. So they know to chase down the right teacher to get the recommendation in. Um, we generate interview cards for all of these people to be sent to the alumni schools committee. And then uh, we receive unsolicited letters of recommendation, that is the not required teacher recommendations, around 28,000 and on average about two for every candidate. Now lots of candidates just play it straight and we don't get any extra letters. Other candidates have 20 people write on their behalf. Um, and those letters are acknowledged when they come in and then they get filed and, and put in. So there's a lot of paperwork that's involved in just setting up 14,311, let alone keep track of names. And in an average year, there'll be around 30 sets of candidates with the same first and last name that are unrelated. There'll be um, uh, around maybe six or seven sets with the same first, middle, and last name unrelated. And usually every year there's one or two pairs of students with the same first, middle, last name, same birth date, but unrelated. And you have to make sure that the paper that comes in, what you're trying to do is to make sure that last pair doesn't get confused. And uh, but we have a number of eyes that check every application, and one reason for doing that is invariably we will pick up where the test scores came in for one of those two and got in the wrong folder instead of the other folder. And that means you're picking up birth dates, you're picking up social security numbers, whatever, um, which is why we have two or three people read every application. No one's going to catch them all, but by having several sets of eyes at different times of day and night, uh, we try and keep, uh, we, in, the, in this job, you really have to aim for zero error. 
we, we are not in a position of being able to be 90% right, 99% right. If we foul up on any one candidate in terms of what we get into their folder or how we've calculated the transcript, for that candidate, it's a 100% error. That, that candidate doesn't figure 99%. And so um, we work very hard at that. The, um, I was talking about all the unsolicited letters of recommendation. We also receive tons of mail, tons of mail. Uh, usually I do, asking our views on ranking in school, uh, certain courses, whatever. And uh, while we only log on names and addresses of people who are going to be sophomores, juniors, or seniors, you can see from this letter I got uh, April 18th, from a young man uh, in the fifth grade. Because for some reason, elementary schools have this thing now of assigning a fifth grade class or fourth grade class to write colleges. Well, Jimmy Barrow wrote me. The, the nice thing about this letter is, P.S., um, he just got a, a haircut called a Princeton haircut. Uh, I don't know if it shows up. You know, the haircut I get is called a Princeton. I never heard of that. But, uh, we, we answer that mail, sometimes we send pennants, sometimes we send decals or whatever. Um, you never know, that, that may be an applicant in the future. <laughs> the, um, to get to reading and evaluating the 14,311 applications, we do all of our evaluating by, uh, by writing it out. Uh, I'm just a great believer that if you have to write something down, you have to think very hard about it. So uh, unlike the movies that you see where people sit around the table and talk about, gee, I really like the cut of his jib or uh, whatever, uh, we write, we ask everybody who's evaluating an application to write it down. It just means you have to think hard. It also means, since we each use a different color ink, each of the readers, that one reader can uh, writes it, and another reader adds to it. Um, that way we can distinguish among readers and we can track it as, as it goes through. The work card looks something like, uh, like this on the front of it. Give you an idea. Up in the top corner would be the name, address, high school, uh, whether they're a citizen or not, uh, their sex and so forth. We only count 10th, 11th, and 12th grades. We do not count 9th. We fill in those boxes after we've worked the transcript, which I'll show you in a minute. Then the labels, score labels, go in the two big empty boxes. We give an, an academic and a non-academic rating at the top and fill that in. We note whether they're Princeton University faculty staff or Princeton University Civ or twin Civ also applying. And in a freshman class, we're likely to have four or five sets of twins actually enrolled. We have a large number of twins or SIBs that are graduating high school the same year in the, in the pool. And so we try and keep track of that. Then um, these are summaries of parts of the application, recommended uh, either early action or regular action uh, actions like admit, swim, um, wait list, reject, and so forth. The second side of the card is where we write summary comments after outlining each of the teacher forms and the school report and so forth. Optional references that come in, any recommendations from Princeton University faculty or administrative staff, the ASC interview, um, and summaries that go down. Now, a card like that is, is uh, in every, every folder, every application we receive. Um, the first thing we do before we read an application is work the transcript. We recalculate the GPA for every transcript that comes in by going through each transcript and uh, counting only solids and then calculating the GPA for that. So we do not take the high school GPA as the GPA of record unless coincidentally it meets our recalculated GPA. To give you an idea, this is a transcript where the high school GPA is 3.675. Our recalculated GPA is 3.39. 
you can see we took out um, health today and tomorrow, uh, guidance, career development, uh, beginning acting, acting intermediate. And then down here we took out band, and then we recalculated the GPA. So that reduces the number, both the number of courses, and in this case, the GPA. Um, we also, that way, get to count the number of courses, the number of solids, which vary a great deal uh, across the country. Now, here's an example of one with uh, four solids on the average. You can see we don't count magical singers, sports conditioning, volleyball, um, and we circle those. Then we calculate the GPA for what's left. In this case, it's a 4.0 with eight courses for each term for the 10th and eight for um, the junior year, four courses each term. Now, you'll want to distinguish that between that and um, so this program where you can see the student also has a 4.0, that is a straight A when we recalculate it, uh, but has uh, five solids each term. So that all we took out were P, E, and health and academic decathlon. And then you'll see has six solids in, um, in, the, senior year, in the junior year. So that candidate will have 10 and then 12. 22 compared to the other one that had 16 for 10th and 11th. And then when the senior year transcript comes in, we do the same thing and add it into the box for the 12th. Um, I don't think many colleges do it that way, but we do. And it really helps you to distinguish in the long run, if you need to, between a relatively weak program, a relatively strong program, um, for students all of whom have uh, roughly the same GPA. We will also note on uh, we note on the work card uh, how many AP or honors courses the student has. And here, uh, some you'll see the AP is marked and then honors, which is usually a level below AP in this school. All the schools have different systems, and we try, try and keep track of it. But we do note not only how many courses they take, what grades they achieve in them, but what relatively the degree of difficulty of, of the courses. Um, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's trickier every year. We always stay with a four-point scale because some schools will grade now to five. Uh, the variations in grading among schools, we, we even it out with our four-point scale and count the number. They will weight courses. What we do is count the number of APs and, and so forth to get a sense of the difficulty of the program. Once we do that working of the transcript and we have the label of the test scores, the SATs, uh, three achievements, uh, in terms of test scores, what we do is we take the highest verbal whenever they achieved it and the highest math whenever they achieved it, and then the highest three different achievement scores. And th that is in three different uh, areas. So in other words, if they have three scores in math, they're going to take the highest score of one of the math exams. Then if they have English or they have biology or they have history, we take the three as the score of record. <laughs> All of the scores remain on the work card, but those are the scores we, we compute, that is, we keep in, in the record as we're going through. And it's based on those scores that, and the grades and the number of courses that we give each candidate an approximate academic rating, and we put them into, we have five academic ratings, one to five, one being highest, five being lowest. It does not divide the applicant group into quintiles. Um, to give you a rough idea, and this is uh, how we have to do it, to get an academic one, 
Uh, for the most part, you need a 4.0 in a very solid program, ranking 1 or 2 percent in your class, with five scores 700 and above. That is two SAT, the two SAT scores and three achievements. Now, uh, we obviously put our eye on every application. If somebody has a 690 and all the rest are 700 or above, the heavy program, whatever, it's probably going to be an academic one. In other words, there are gray areas between any of these ratings, but there's no confusing a one and a three, a two and a four, a three and a five anything like that. Um, and so those are our general guidelines. For students in abroad, for instance, who will often have more modest verbals if their schooling has been in non-English, uh, frequently they'll have very high achievement test scores, high math score. They'll have a more modest verbal score. They'll take tests of English as a foreign language, which will usually equate to higher equivalency in, in the verbal. Um, and so it could be that a student with a 500 verbal abroad and all 700 still is going to be an academic one if all other things in that folder suggest this is a top candidate. Um, we also give a non-academic rating which is far less scientific and far less predictive of who going to get in. Um, and roughly it's this. Um, if you pub have published the book, or you're All-American, or you performed in Carnegie Hall, or you hold a patent, you're going to get a non-academic one. Maybe a dozen people get a non-academic one uh, in a given year, or something like that. Um, no, more than a dozen, but not a very large number. Uh, two is unusual depth and breadth and achievement, usually recognized at state or regional level. This could be in music or athletics, or again, um, statewide organizations. Uh, three is clearly above average, but that's where most of our candidates are. They may be captain of two or three sports, or concert master of the orchestra, or concert mistress, or editor of the newspaper. For us, this is all relevant. That is, those are usually outstanding achievements in any school, but in our group, they're at about a three. Uh, on down to five, which is, um, really doesn't look like they do anything else. Um, that's just for grouping candidates. It will not tell you whom we admit, per se. For the class we just admitted, to give you some idea of how many, what the numbers look like, we had 1,229 that got an academic one, 3,906 got an academic two, uh, on down, or 648, 1,648 of the 14,311 were valedictorians. Our recalculated GPA 4.0s were 3,902, um, which is going to be smaller than the number of the schools would think they have out there. But still, 3,902 4.0 GPA. 3.8 or better, that means you have one or two Bs. Um, would be 7,198 of the candidates had a 3.8 or better. Yes? No, often it's in the, a, the application. A lot of schools pick their valedictorian based on who is at the top by the mid-year. Yeah, they will tell you. Um, on the SATs, uh, using approximate percentiles for achieving on it, 650 or plus verbal SAT, 5,500 of the candidates, and a 700 plus on the math SAT, 7,796. Now, just looking at those numbers will give you some idea of how many people are out there in that group of 14,311 that wonder why what they did wasn't enough to get selected. Because uh, many of them uh, are you know, 4.0s or 3.9s or 3.8s. Many of them have uh, relatively high test scores. With those test scores, you can do the work in any college, certainly. Um, but that gives you some idea of what the, um, the numbers uh, look like. In going through that group to select, um, we have a number of goals in, in bringing together a freshman class. Obviously, uh, to try and attract as many very able students as we can, but who represent, who have 
different academic interests, who have different background experiences, special skills and abilities, of uh, different aspirations, and the kinds of things they, they think they want to do. And um, you try and bring a class together in a residential place like this that will not only be academically able, but in some sense will be interesting people to be around, will make a contribution to the university, to their classmates, to the classroom, to precepts, whatever. Um, if you took just the top 4,000 candidates, in most colleges, any college gives its right arm to have that 5,000 academic ones and twos. So about 60% of our undergraduates are academic ones and twos. Plenty of talent to work with here. Um, but if you took that 5,000 and you're aiming for a class, freshman class of 1,130, you're going to make 2,000 offers of admission. Um, there are a lot of different combinations you can come up with. Uh, I was struck once in reading two or three years ago one of these um, best short stories, I think, or best essays with Joyce Carol Oates edited. And in the preface to that book, she pointed out that in order to be considered for inclusion in the best uh, essays, you, the essay already had to have been published in a very good publication. And she received 300, and she had to choose the best 20. And she wondered how many combinations of best 20 you could put together out of 300. And she asked a colleague here in physics who gave her a number that was in the billions and billions. Um, different combinations of 20, all the different combinations you could have. That made me wonder how many different combinations of 1,130 people you could, 2,000 admits, whatever you want, you could put together out of 5,000 or 4,000 or 3,000. And Dick DeVoe, who was here in statistics at the time, was on the admissions committee, and I asked him. And he gave me this formula, which I think is factorial, which says, given N applicants, how many different classes of size X can be made from them? He used the example of five applicants, um, a size freshman class of three, and how many, 10 different combinations. He said, if you're working with 2,000 or 3,000, how many different combinations of 1,130 could you come up with, uh, to put it in Dick's words, more than there are stars in the sky. That is, billions and billions of different combinations. Uh, the reason I point that out is because when you turn down, as we did this year, 12,000 people, uh, it's not easy to go back and for a number of the candidates and give an explicit rank order or specific rank order saying, well, I'm sorry, you rank 2,501. Uh, it's very hard to actually rank order a group of 12,000 or 14,311. You can approximately group them as we do in the academic groupings. But uh, the notion of how you would rank people taking into account different achievement scores for different achievement tests, um, SAT scores, grades, and so forth. I imagine if you worked hard enough, you might come up with an algorithm that would somehow do it. The, the problem is that you would be very hard to get consensus on what weight to give um, to uh, SATs versus achievements, to one achievement versus another achievement, to AP scores, to ranking class, to GPA, to number of courses, and so forth. <coughs> and so for a number of the people that write me after they get turned down, in any number of cases, I simply write back and say, I would have written had I been you too. You, you're really as good as the candidates that we admitted, but we couldn't admit everyone to a class limited in size to around 1,130, or, or this year I think 1,150 is what we were aiming for. Uh, what we do in reading the applications to try and get a handle on this, we tell the candidates ahead of time that not everybody admitted is going to have higher test scores and higher grades than everybody not admitted. We were explicit about that. Um, 
but you have an application that has test scores, grades, so forth. And there are a number of outside observers, including an education writer for the Newark Ledger, I guess, whatever it is, who must be down to his last marble, um, who really can't understand ever admitting anybody that has a lower GPA or somebody who has a higher GPA. I mean, his, uh, that's the only way he can think. If you introduce achievement tests into it, a number of courses, let alone introduce the application, that is, how they respond to the essays and the application and so forth and so on, uh, he gets confused. And um, so, in effect, to a lot of the public out there who are responding to the decisions we make. And by and large, our rule is the same as um, we try and follow, or at least I try and follow, the dictum for the medical profession, which is first do no harm. So I don't ever write back to a candidate unless they've questioned my parentage. Um, I, I don't write back and say, I hate to tell you, but 90% of our applicants had better overall credentials than you did. Or I don't write back and say, yes, you had straight A's, but in a very weak program. We don't do any of that. You don't gain anything by that. Um, and it's better to let them be mad and upset than to rub anything in. And, um, but on the other hand, they're, they're out there and they see, uh, from their perspective, a process that, in one case, doesn't seem to reward their having been first in the class ever since kindergarten. They don't see our rewarding a system where they had 750 and somebody they know that had a 650 got in in the school. We go through those folders and read all kinds of stories. All kinds of stories. At, you know, a young man or young woman presenting themselves. And I've often described the process as one where we're really mediating, as poets are said to do, um, between the candidate as he or she sees himself or herself, the candidate as the school and the recommenders see him or her, and the candidate, as far as we can figure out, as he or she really is. And those views are often different. What we try and do is bring them together somehow to get a, a fix on the candidate, to know who that young man or that young woman is, and roughly what their dimensions are um, in terms of their academic interests, in terms of uh, the liveliness of their mind, in terms of their capacity. Uh, nowhere more than in the applicant group do you see how misleading grades can be. I mean, everybody, I, I've attended meetings for 20 some years where everyone debates test scores, the value of test scores. I've never been to a meeting that debated the value of grades. If you take 5,100 schools from which you get our applicants and try and figure out whether in any one of those schools an A in history is the same as an A in English, is the same as an A in math, let alone whether the A's in history, math, and English in that school are, are given by the same standards as the next school, or 5,000 some other schools that are in our applicant group. Um, but we do our best to mediate those, those three factors. We recognize that excellence comes in a variety of shapes and sizes. Probably the best writer in the applicant we just admitted this year um, is probably one of the worst in math. I wrote this young woman after we admitted her, and I said, you really are the best writer I've seen, but I wouldn't trust you with my checkbook. Um, she happens also to be the winner of the Princeton Poetry Prize, um, which for two years running, the winner has decided to enroll at Princeton. But that's what you look at in an application. You're not adding up her verbal and her math. In fact, her verbal's not an 800, but it's just very clear that she can write a lot better than some of the applicants who have very high verbal scores. Um, and so we're balancing all of those things. Um, 
I, I was reading a review of some artists the other day in, in the New Republic, and the reviewer, a fellow named Jed Pearl, was referring to these two artists saying probably more important than their knowing everything was that they knew the limits of what they knew. And that in some cases, being inexact was the best way to be exact. And it struck me that there's an element of truth in that applicable to admissions, and that is that the best way to be exact is that being inexact, as we are in talking about applications, may be the best way to approach exactness. Um, what we have to alert people to is the fact that admissions is a zero-sum game. We admit about 14% of our applicants now. That means for every candidate we admit, there are going to be six who are not admitted. There are any number of um, constituencies who are interested in what we do, hundreds of them. Um, and we are fortunate in being able to go through this process completely need blind. We have no idea whether the candidate needs aid or doesn't. We make our decision. We enter it on the computer. Financial aid office, which is in a different part of the building, picks it up each day off the computer, checks to see if the person applied for aid, calculates their aid, their need, if they have applied. Um, and, and then we just don't communicate with them on that level. So we're really lucky. We're one of probably the last half dozen schools that literally I don't have to, none of us on the staff have to worry about whether this candidate is a, is a high need candidate or no need candidate or somewhere in the middle. The, um, the pressures that come to bear are not only the constituencies, imagine just the ones in the university, let alone all the ones outside. Um, it has struck me that nowhere in the country, probably um, than in the admissions offices of the highly selective colleges, such as Princeton, do the various strains in the American character come home to roost. The aristocratic strain, the egalitarian strain, and the meritocratic strain. And there is no one sitting in this room, I would wager, <coughs> who is not in part of his or her life at times aristocratic, or is not in part of his or her life at some time meritocratic in their way of thinking, or is not in his or her life egalitarian. All of those come home to roost in selective admissions. Um, John Gardner in Excellence uh, points out that if you want to see a Democrat become an aristocrat overnight, watch what happens to him when his daughter applies to college, to his college. And so in some sense, um, uh, we have that element. People who believe that it is the parents who, uh, who ought to be taken into consideration when a child is admitted to pass on to their children um, uh, certain benefits. Everybody, if you ask them, says, yes, I'm meritocratic. I, I really believe people ought to get ahead on their own merits. The difficulty enters when you ask what they mean by merit. People have a lot of different notions of what comprises merit. Uh, and we get them all. Some, I, I mean, just a whole variety. Some is grades, some are test scores, um, some are overcoming handicaps, some are uh, all, all, a whole set of them. And we wrestle with those all the time. And certainly our attempt to keep a diverse student body, to maintain one, to enroll one, has an egalitarian aspect. When we're looking at these up here, the um, transcripts, we'll see a 4.0, four courses, not five, not six, straight A's, no APs, no honors. The next question we ask is how well has that student done with the resources available to them? If that school, if the student is in a school without any APs, and there are plenty, uh, if that student really, you know, is from a non-college background, if that student's extracurricular activity, if you will, is working 20 hours a week, 
to help the family out but doing nothing else. Those are factors that go into our saying to ourselves, well, they've done the best with what they've had available to them. Let's see what they would do with what Princeton would make available to them. And in some cases, we'll make that kind of decision. And in some sense, that's egalitarian in nature. That is, you're trying to, as best you can, uh, put these applicants on a kind of equal footing, if you will, to see what they've had and what they've done with it and where they're going. Um, everybody's for diversity. It's a word you come to hate in admissions, <laughs> diversity, because everyone's for it as long as they're included. I mean, I, I talk to students here all the time who wonder why we don't have more of X. And I say, well, one way we can get it is for you to give up your place. Everyone here thinks we made the right decision in their case. It's in all the others we admitted that we seem to have gone wrong. And that's true for any member of the class, of any, any of the classes. And it's not unusual for students to come to us who do not represent diversity in any sense to complain that there isn't more diversity in the other students we admitted with them. Um, so I use the term variety. I, we never use the term well-rounded in admissions. I've never used it in my whole life. We do talk about multiple talents. I mean, if I go to the, uh, the uh, spring concert or, or in addition, the, the concert last Friday night with the orchestra and the glee club, and where they tend to introduce seniors at the end of either the spring concert for the orchestra or this last concert for the glee club, and people stand up, people are majoring in electrical engineering, history, and so forth. Um, these are people with multiple talents. I, I don't ever consider them well-rounded. They just are able to do any number of things well. And, um, and we seek and get our fair share of those kinds of people around here. Um, the constituencies, um, we try and hold at bay as much as we can. Uh, you get very conscious when you're doing admissions of trying to be fair. And no sh fair, there are no courses at Princeton in fairness. There's no guarantee that anybody who graduates from Princeton or any other university has any sense of fairness or any sense of merit, uh, and so forth and so on. Um, and uh, it's not guaranteed for anybody. College educations don't give it. But what, when we're sitting there, we're very conscious. So what would be the fairest way to do the kinds of things we're doing? Uh, more and more people have problems um, or rationalizations. I mean, the applications to college are full of rationalizations. Uh, we used to, uh, we ask, uh, still ask, you know, is there anything else you'd like to tell us that we haven't asked you? Often people will say, well, as you notice, my grades are low. Um, I have lousy teachers. Or, as you will notice, my test scores are low, but my aunt died the night before I took my SATs, or my dog died. That's a big one. Um, but to that growing list, you have um, a, a variety of things, not just attention deficit disorder or acute attention deficit disorder, but we're now getting into things like um, my son is a ruminator, a ponderer. That's why he hasn't done well in school. And uh, so, you know, I'm thinking to myself, next time I get on a plane, I'm going to ask the pilot if he's a ruminator or a ponderer, or uh, was he one of those people who could solve things more quickly, uh, whatever. Um, people are poor test takers. I've never known what that meant. You never hear about somebody being a poor grade getter. He's poor test taking. And I'm reminded when I took the SATs, which was before anybody in this room probably was born, um, it was well done at that time because the student never received the scores. They only went to the high school and the college. So I never knew my test scores until I ended up teaching at Swarthmore College and then became a dean of admissions there. Called back to Haverford where I went and asked them if they could look up my test scores, which I had taken when I was 21 when I got out of the Army. And they told me what my test scores were, which was one of the dumbest phone calls I ever made. Uh, 
And when people ask me later, I used to call them low, and, and then I learned to call them modest. But uh, <laughs> people asked why, how I had come to have such modest test scores, and I said it was pretty simple. Uh, there were a lot of questions on that test I didn't know the answers to. That was it. Nobody in my family expired the night before. Uh, I wasn't a poor test taker. Uh, I didn't freeze on tests. The test room was warm. Uh, there were just a lot of questions, the answers to which I didn't know, <laughs> and which, fortunately, I later learned, but or most of them, at least I learned. But we get all of that coming in, uh, people rationalizing this, that, and the other thing. The, the fastest student I think I've ever put in the admit pile was a student who said, is there anything, we said, is there anything else you'd like to tell us? And said, yes, as you will notice, my test scores are low. They are accurate. It was a young man from out, way out in the Midwest uh, who simply didn't want us to get him in over his head. He was very straightforward, whatever. And I thought, we need at least one student here who, uh, who wasn't going to make any excuses. And we figured he'd do well, and he did. Uh, the sheer odds of getting in have become a problem. Uh, if you look at the recent history, I, I've just done this to give you a sense of 15 years. Uh, for the class of 1980, there were 10,305 candidates, 23% of whom were admitted. On down to the last two years here where it's in the 14,000 range and only 14% are being admitted. Um, that creates, obviously, a lot of pressure. Um, and creates a, a certain amount of anxiety on, on the part of the candidates applying. It's not unusual for us to, um, to get, well, my son got into, or my daughter got into X, Y, and Z, but not Princeton, I don't understand. Now, I've often thought that the only virtue, maybe the main virtue, of the way we do admissions in this country is the fact that um, it's unlikely that we're all going to land admitting the, exactly the same 2,000, in which case none of us would fill our freshman classes and only 2,000 people would be admitted to selective colleges. And there's a certain built-in uh, utility to the system being as loose as it is. Um, but we do get that, and I think people have, don't have a clear idea. I would never really do this in public, but to give you some idea of just the Ivies and some others for last year's class of 98, where you see um, the, the initials would be no secret, they're in alphabetical order. But there's a lot of difference between admitting 22% and 14%, or 36% and 14%. And Princeton and Harvard are the ones admitting at the 14% range. Um, and other schools, there's just a lot of difference between selecting one out of five one out of four, one out of seven, a major, major difference. Even if the applicant groups all completely overlapped, which they don't. And then you see the yield varies for each of the schools, with Harvard by far having the highest yield, 75, partly because it's generic name uh, for universities. And, um, and then Princeton with 57 last year. That, that has shot up considerably this year, although we're not going to give out any numbers for this year until we have an Ivy Dean's meeting tomorrow and have some idea of what, what's happened at the other Ivy schools. But if everything holds right now, we'll probably have the best profile we've ever had in all kinds of dimensions, men, women, minority, academic credentials, the whole works. It's just that it may be a little larger <laughs> than we anticipated. Um, here you see is Duke, uh, MIT, and Stanford, um, where the percentages. This is for past last year. They don't they don't very much. I don't think they'll very much this year. But you can see why one's odds are a little different for the same candidate at different schools. Um, what's happening um, out there? Recent developments. There are two recent developments undertaken by College Board, which, uh, to put it mildly, struck me as inane, but we're going to have to live with. One is last year they introduced something called score choice. They make it possible for a student taking an achievement test to not have them released to colleges. 
until they get a chance to look at them and decide whether to release them or not. Unfortunately, uh, by the time they get them to look at them, usually the deadline for having the scores in is passed. And um, the college is just sitting there without any test scores. It's also, I think, a little misleading to, I mean, the next thing is grade choice. Decide what grades in high school you want submitted and which ones to hold back. Essay choice. I've written your essays, but I don't care to submit them. Uh, you know, on down the line, it's a kind of dumb thing, particularly for the selective colleges, which always take the highest scores of record anyway. We don't hold low scores or earlier test scores against the student. But that has really, um, really, from this past year, made a heck of a lot of hard work for us, such that I wrote College Board in January and said that for early action candidates, this has been a hair-raising experience. In which case, they at least responded and sent to all the candidates taking the test in January, warning them that if they chose score choice, the scores would probably not get to the colleges in the spring in time by the time they decided to release them. The second thing they've done beginning in April of this year, what we call the Lake Wobegon effect, to make everybody healthy and happy. That's not why they did it, but they're recentering the test scores. So that you can see if you took the uh, test score in April of 95 or later, uh, your scores are going to shift upwards by about 70 points in the verbal. So that if you took them in January and you got a 730, that now, if you took it in April, would be an 800. As you can see, everything from 730 on up now becomes an 800 under recentered tests. The shift upward is less dramatic in math. Uh, and there are a few cases, in, at least in math, where the score will go down a little bit. But um, you can see on the left, that is, the scores a student might have gotten last year, and the scores now that that same uh, test result would yield beginning in April 95 and on. So we are now, for this year, going to be dealing in the next two years with applicants who have taken both test scores before April and test scores April and afterwards and having to get them on the same scale. The thing is, we're probably going to have to convert them to the higher scale because there's no way of finding out which 800 would have been a 730 or would have been a 740 or would have been a 790. Um, at any rate, that and in terms of students looking at your profile to decide whether or not they're in range to apply to the college, we're now going to have to have two profiles for a while. The profile of the class of 99, which is entering, will be one set of scores, pre recenter Then we're going to have to convert that into what they look like recentered, so that students who take the test can then kind of get a sense of, of um, you know, where they fit in, in the range of people taking it. The last development is um, one we decided to put into effect this coming year, we decided last year, and that's to move away from early action to early decision. And the reason for doing that, uh, there's several reasons. One is that early action is a one-sided deal, that is, uh, you stop everything in November, at least half the staff, and act on applications to notify students by mid-December who then have until May 1st to let you know whether they're enrolling or not. There really was no quid pro quo. But when we get to the last two weeks in April, in uh, March, uh, we're going through maybe for two, three hundred places left to admit to three or four thousand applications um, and making very, very hairline choices about who is going to be admitted and who isn't. And it struck us lots of times that the person we're putting in the admit pile, for all we know, has us as last choice and is going to just get a lot of offers. And the person we're putting in the non-admit pile would give the right arm to come to Princeton if we only knew it. Uh, and they're interchangeable in terms of their credentials. We wondered if there were a non-suspect way to let a candidate tell us their first choice. If we just asked on an application, are we your first choice, that, that, that you put students in the position of telling every college. Early decision allows a student to say, this is first choice and you don't have to suspect because of am admitted I'm enrolling. And it's honored by other colleges. Um, and, uh, in a, and, and that will 
A, uh, give us a chance in the applicant group for a lot of the top candidates to know who really wants to come to Princeton. We asked the high schools about it, and of course they, most of them, are very pleased with it because they have candidates who applied early, got into one place, and kept seven other applications in and got in. And the high schools began to feel that other good candidates they had were being overlooked um, because the same colleges were, again, admitting more of the same candidates. It doesn't bring the whole process around to rationality, but it does inch it a little more to being rational by having that avenue for candidates to, to ask for an early decision um, on the basis of their committing to enroll. It also enables us, when we're doing regular action, to have a better fix on who it is that's already going to be in the class in terms of their mix. Um, academically and otherwise, to know then if we can make more informed decisions and regular action to fill that, that group in. So we'll be moving to that this year. Uh, that's my summary of the year as best I can do it in an hour and be happy to answer any questions if people have them. Yes? Uh, I'm probably the best feedback in the sense that I also sit on the which meets uh, seven or eight times a year, in which uh, time we review the students who are in academic difficulty. And uh, the faculty stare down the table at me, uh, wondering how this one got in. But uh, what it tells you is that there is a lot that we can't know about any candidate. Um, last spring, there were six candidates at one of those meetings that were in difficulty, something like four of them had 800 verbals exceptional records. Students get into difficulty for a lot of different reasons and uh, uh, more often than not it's students whose credentials aren't it's nothing you could have picked up in the application. Uh, so in that sense it's there but um, there's a lot we can't predict about what an 18 or 19 year old is going to do over the next four years. On the other hand, our academic ratings turn out to be a better predictor of achievement at Princeton than SATs alone or GPA alone. Um, a, a very high correlation between academic ratings and how people finish up in the senior class. There are always exceptions, but not enough to make us think we don't have it heading in the right direction. Think of all the other things that intervene in a student's life that, that we don't know about. Um, that's, that's the feedback. What we don't have feedback on are things like character. If I had my druthers, uh, I would never admit anybody to college that wasn't 21 years or older. Uh, that would solve a lot of what we perceive to be immature behavior. I mean, let's face it, most of and the problem with most candidates going to college is they've been in school since about age four around adults, most of whom themselves have been in school since age four. It doesn't give you much perspective. And, um, and I think they do amazingly well given they've been locked up for that long in educational institutions. My, uh, we have 30 or, 40, 30 or 25 kids a year who defer a year to do something else. And often I think they get the problems of moving away from home out of their system by going on an AFS program or working somewhere for a year uh, or doing studies in a special area, which they wouldn't be able to do intensively if they started in college. But I don't know. Uh, you wish you could gauge the maturity factor. You wish you could gauge the character factor. But it's, that's hard in people who are 25 and 40, let alone if people are 18 and 19. Uh, I, this weekend, uh, when I, I went to the concert at Glee Club, there must have been a couple of hundred kids there. Saturday morning, I got up and watched the crews row. Saturday afternoon, I watched men's lacrosse. Sunday afternoon, I watched women's rugby. Um, and if you go on with the participation in Student Volunteer Council, all the acapella groups, um, the daily newspaper, such as it is, uh, other kinds of things. The great majority of students here are really acquitting themselves very, very well. But 
they're not what comes to our attention. I mean, I, the more I thought about it, when I, Friday night at the concert, I just wished that every faculty member were there. And that's all extra duty, those kids practice. Uh, I wish the faculty had been at the rugby game on Sunday. I, just, just to see that there are kids who are fairly normal, who uh, cut through here and do fairly well, and, and uh, don't bash out any lampposts, and you know, have learned how to have a beer without going over the edge. But uh, compared to other schools, uh, I think we do okay. I, I don't think we do as well as we'd like, but uh, we had a recruit this year who got involved in an incident at Harvard. Um, athletic recruit. Made all the Boston papers. You don't read about it in Princeton, but was hosted uh, by people who were drinking a lot. One of their private clubs, which are equivalent to our club. And a big bash leading to some students being suspended and so forth. And I thought, you know, it, we tend to think at Princeton <laughs> what's happening. We don't really know what's going on elsewhere. I think it's the age group. And of course, when anything like that happens, I get mail from people who got turned down the year before, uh, saying, you know, you turn my son down and I see you have this character who did the following. Uh, and that's human nature. When I was at Stanford, I got a letter from parents of a student we turned down I'll show you how long people can hold grudges, and sent me an invitation to his initiation into Phi Beta Kappa at Berkeley. And I thought about it. I actually thought about going, uh, but I did. And I wrote and said, and I'm sorry I'm unable to make it, but uh, in return you're invited to the initiation of Phi Beta Kappa here at Stanford, <laughs> in which, you know, Approximately 10% of the class there were graduate from Phi Beta Kappa. I mean, uh, the perspective you get in admissions so often is so different than, the, and I understand the perspective of a parent uh, or a, a son or daughter who's done very well and just doesn't get in a good place. Other questions? Yes. As we say in the literature, we send to all candidates before they apply, we do give preference to alumni children. And by alumni children, we mean a mother or father who graduated from here, not anybody else. Um, a lot of people out there still think of legacies from the old days when it was having had an uncle attend or grandfather and so forth. We try and call it all things being equal, they get the nod if they're as good as the two or three others similarly uh, qualified whom we're going to have to turn down. I mean, yeah, assume there's six for every one we take, they're going to have to turn down, and two or three are probably going to be as well qualified. And we do our best in that regard. Uh, and so while we have a 14% overall admission rate, the admission rate for alumni children is in the 40s. And it doesn't take uh, PhD to figure out that that means the overall rate for everybody else is lower than 14. The, the problem is that, that that seems to me a clear preference. Uh, their academic credentials will by and large match the class as a whole. That is, you won't find um, alumni children having lower SAT averages than, than the class as a whole. But um, it doesn't matter if that were 90% admit rate for the 10% who don't get in. I mean, if your child doesn't get in, it doesn't matter if 90% of the others did. Uh, and the alumni whose son or daughter doesn't get in, doesn't think much of the preference. It doesn't think we give much weight. But that's, that's by and large how we do it. Yes? No, uh, the only lesson I think to be learned by that is that Harvard has not said one word since then. Which I think is very smart. They did not feel compelled to fill in the blank spaces when reporters called. They just didn't reply. My sense is that, I, I have to tell you a little bit about this story, because about a week before it broke, I was talking to my counterpart at Harvard, 
who said, uh, Fred, you, you ought to know we plagiarized your acknowledgement card, the response card for admitted candidates this year. We barred. We have on the back of our response card, we reserve the right to withdraw admission for any of the following five reasons. Drop in academic performance, you're holding a place in more than one freshman class, you engage in any behavior that calls into question moral character and so forth. So uh, we knew other colleges, Kofi colleges, had asked for our card this year because most of them didn't have conditions on the back and we've had them on. Um, and he said it's already come in handy. So I didn't think anything more. I just thought he met somebody that admitted early action and had flunked high school in the middle of the year. Five days later, this breaks, and I see our condition quoted on the screen, <laughs> engaging in more, I mean, exact wording. Um, they, uh, I, I, I have a copy of their application. They went to the common application this year. And next year, they're probably going to have them on those newsstands by checkout counters, like <laughs> Star Weekly. Harvard just could not understand why we admitted at a lower rate than they did. So they've made sure that doesn't happen again. Uh, the common application only has one question. It says, have you been expelled, suspended, or put on probation by your school within the last three years? As far as I can tell, that young woman answered that question honestly. Since then, um, they, I've seen something about an alumni interviewer saying she was misleading in the interview about how her mother died. I, I just don't know where that came from. But um, our question, by the way, on our application, she wrote for materials to Princeton last fall and didn't apply, uh, is have you ever been suspended, put on probation by your, or disciplined by your high school? and or have you ever been arrested for anything other than a traffic violation? And uh, I think had they had that question, she would have, she checked with her lawyer about answering Harvard's question. I, I do think she answered it accurately. But uh, so that the first question is whether or not she misled them, and I just have no idea. I know not on the application because I, I, I think that I would have answered it the same way she did. Um, on the other, then they faced another problem. They did a very big story on this young woman the week before it broke about here's an orphan who has made it into Harvard in the Boston Globe. At which point somebody who recognized her then sent anonymous articles to, Boston, to the Globe and to Harvard. So they woke up the next morning facing either a headline in the Globe that says Harvard admits murderer or Harvard rescinds admission to murder. And, that, that, that would have been tough. I do think, um, from what I read about the case subsequently, they probably made the right decision. I mean, uh, um, who's the woman? Ellen Goodman writes editorials for the op-eds for the Globe, and she wrote a very good one on it, I thought, that said, you know, there are, there are some things that you do that are difficult to erase and just wipe off the record and not consider the future effects of, and many other things not. I mean, we, we have people every year that answer the question, yes, I've been suspended, disciplined, arrested. I was arrested in ninth grade for shoplifting at Woolworths. That doesn't um, We had a student who um, was served two years in jail when I was at Stanford as a conscientious objector. Uh, but but the nature of that case is substantially different. And I suspect that their legal counsel also was following what happened in New York two years ago when a young woman got raped or murdered by a fellow student who had served time for murder. And I think the State University of New York was held liable for that. It's a very complicated case, so uh, that's as much as I know about it. Fred, can you stick around for a while? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Thank you.